Welcome everybody, and of course, thanks for attending this meetup, and thanks for for my friends at uh, Softer Circus for uh, having me again. Um, uh, I've been, you know, I've been going to uh, the Softer Circus meetup for a long time, and uh, and so it's always a pleasure to actually uh, present at Softer Circus. Um, so this talk, plain spotting from zero to deep learning. Uh, I just need to say a word of caution here. Uh, it, it's kind of a fun talk and a bit lighthearted too, so it's, it's not a lot of code. Uh, it's really uh, an overview, an intro to deep learning. So if you're interested, intrigued by deep learning and AI in general, this is a, this is a perfect place for you. Otherwise, if you're already an expert, there's probably not gonna be a lot uh, for you to see. Okay, and with that said, uh, as Sam suggested, time for a little, little introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Fabio Tiritico, and I am an Italian living in the Netherlands. Uh, the pandemic makes me look like a football player. I don't usually have this haircut, but you know, like with the pandemic, you sort of don't want to go to the hairdresser. So my girlfriend was tasked to, uh, to do my hair, and, uh, and, and actually she does a pretty job, uh, I'm sure. Pretty good job. I'm sure uh, most of you are, many of you are in the same situation. Um, I certainly don't earn as much as football players because I am a software engineer and also community manager. Uh, this community side of myself makes me hate 2020 even more than usual. I run this meetup, Reactive Amsterdam, which has been pretty inactive since the pandemic started. I'm also one of the organizers of the Kubernetes Community Days Amsterdam, which unfortunately we had to cancel entirely for this year. Uh, it was just, uh, just didn't work very well. Also with KubeCon happening in Amsterdam is, uh, and then going virtual. So back to, uh, I mean, no, forward to 2020. We'll see what happens then. But now let's go on to the meat of this talk. Uh, a little background I want to give you about this talk, uh, and, and that's about the Plains idea. What's this Plains idea? Uh, I had this idea about maybe a year ago when I used to work uh, next to the Amsterdam airport in Schiphol. So what you see on screen now is a section of Google Maps uh, of the airport. And if you see this section that I just highlighted, that's the first airstrip that was built like a very long time ago, before uh, Second World War. Then, and as traffic grew uh, in the airport and you know, planes became more and more of a common thing, they had to build a second airstrip, which was this one that I just highlighted on the screen. And, but as you can see, in between those two, there was already a big highway. It's called A4. So what's the solution here? Well, they simply, to cut short between the two, built a bridge over the highway. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it if you've ever driven around the Netherlands. But the result is that you have these massive planes going from one airstrip to the other one during taxi that cross the highway just a few meters above the cars. So this picture, which you also see behind me, if Zoom hasn't filmed me yet, is what I could see from my office. So I, I don't know if it causes the, in you the same excitement that it caused in me, but like you have these huge planes moving, you know, peacefully strolling just on top of these tiny, tiny cars and trucks and people uh, underneath. And, and, and it was really pretty spectacular for me. I always wanted to take a picture every time that there's a, a plane in it on, on the bridge. But of course, you don't know when a plane is going to pass by. And so here's the idea. I am going to train a artificial intelligence, uh, a neural network, uh, that will run my Raspberry Pi connected to a camera. They will take pictures of the bridge constantly, say like once a minute or something, and then use this uh, neural network to tell, identify whether there is a plane or not in the picture. And then if there's a plane on the picture, it will tweet it. That's, that's the basic idea. And of 
Of course, you're going to say, well, you could use Google Cloud or like Azure ML or whatever. They have already all these object recognition um, set up in place. But I, I really just wanted to learn more about AI and, and build it from scratch, see what it takes. So here's the setup. On the right, you see my Raspberry Pi next to the window. Uh, in the picture, you see there is a bridge in the distance and there's actually a plane on it. And the output of this Raspberry Pi would be two kinds of pictures that you see on the right, which is either there's a plane on the bridge or not. So uh, before building the network, um, let's have a little bit of an overview about deep learning and what it is. Now, if you have the grand scheme of artificial intelligence, you see that machine learning itself is a subset of artificial intelligence. And deep learning, which is you know, called neural networks otherwise, it's a subset of machine learning. So um, this is how the three concepts uh, stand next to each other. And if we're going to look at machine learning and deep learning, two common uses are uh, regression and classification, where regression, a first very common use, basically answers the question, how much? The idea is, for instance, uh, that graph that you see on the left might represent, say, uh, I don't know, the, the, the median house price given square meters. Um, and so what you try to do is try to identify a function that is able to predict reliably what will be the price given the square meters. So what, is, what, what will be one outcome given one input, purely based on data that you collected. And the other use case, classification, basically answers the question, what kind? So in this picture, kind of famous, you see, remember this guy did, did an experiment about training a neural network to, um, you know, distinguish between a raspberry muffin and a blueberry muffin and a chihuahua dog. And as you can see, it's pretty hard. I mean, myself looking at it sometimes, I'm not really quite sure what I'm looking at. But so the idea is classification, where you have multiple possible classes, in this case two, chihuahua or blueberry muffin, and you want to know to which uh, class your item, your image belongs. In our case, the plants, it's exactly a classification between two classes use case, whether there's a plane on the bridge or no plane. Now, how do we build our deep learning network? Well, here came my first revelation in this path, in this journey. AI really is just at a stage of trial and error. Um, you know, if you want to write an algorithm that, you know, computes, I don't know, the area of a square given a side of the square, given the, the length of the side. Uh, you can write an algorithm that does it and, and, and like deterministically. But in, in deep learning, this just doesn't work. We, we only know that for some problems, like image recognition in our case, certain architectures work better than others. And so there is a table, there is, you know, a large literature about these architectures. So we're just gonna look at a couple of, of these ones, of these architectures. Um, one very, very popular type of deep network, deep learning, uh, you know, neural network is the recurrent neural network. Uh, typical use case would be processes where inputs form sequences in time. So the idea is, is a use case where each input is somehow related to what comes before it and what comes after it. And a typical example is speech recognition or speech synthesis. So products like Google Home or Alexa, uh, you know, Siri, those kinds of, these kinds of assistants are full of neural, recurrent neural networks. They need to understand what you say and sort of speak back to you. So you, you can imagine there's a lot of recurrent neural networks in there. Uh, another architecture, extremely popular, convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks have their incredible, powerful uh, use case of image recognition. 
which could be, uh, you know, faces, animal, or, uh, you know, street signs. Uh, if you take like a car, a self-driving car, like a Tesla, must be full of convolutional neural networks. There will be, I guess, one to uh, identify whether a traffic light is red or green, uh, one to uh, identify speed limit signs and things like that. Uh, and then there's many more um, deep learning architectures, but for our talk, we're going to focus on convolutional neural network. It really is what, what we need for our planes. What are the basic of a neural network? You might gonna ask, well, the very basic unit of a neural network is the artificial neuron, where the name comes from. If you look at this scheme, a neuron is basically a function called transfer function that receives a set of weight inputs, in this case, W1, W2, all the way to Wn. Um, it receives these inputs, applies this function, and the output of this function, called confusingly enough the net input, the output of this function is put through another function called activation function, which really, in fact, is just a filter. So uh, an activation function in most cases is, is kind of very simple. It will just decide whether the global output of the artificial neuron will be actually propagated, outputted or not. So in a very simple case, it could be the, the output of the neuron as a whole could be zero or rest which is the output of the transfer function. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, of course, there's, there's, more, there's different transfer functions and different activation functions, but this is really the core concept of, of an artificial neuron. And you might, you might tell me, oh, that doesn't really look that powerful. What's the story here? Well, the power of these kind of uh, constructs come when they are combined together in very large amounts, in very large numbers. This would be an example case of a combination of these neurons uh, creating a, a simple called multi-layer neural network. Called multi-layer in this case because if you look at it, if you read it from left to the right, you see we'll have the first, first we'll have the input values, the, you know, our inputs to, to our network. Then the first layer would be an input layer. What these neurons do, typically these neurons are configured to just propagate the information as the way they receive it, propagate it through to all the neurons that come in the next layer, which is the first so-called hidden layer. This layer will do the transfer function and the activation function, and each neuron will decide whether to propagate it the information, the output of its own transfer function further to the second hidden layer. Same story here. And finally, all the information coming from the neurons in the second hidden layer will be collapsed into the output layer. Output layer is, in this case, these two neurons that will have to basically uh, give an output to the outside world. And you know what kind of output it is depends on the specific case. Let's look at an example. So let's say we have A, B, and C as input values. Then our input layer will just propagate all this information to, this, to, the, first, to the neurons in the first hidden layer. And then let's say in this case, only two neurons of the first hidden layer are going to propagate the result of the functions. Then the neurons in the second hidden layer receive this result and apply their own functions. Only two of them propagate it further to the output layer. And this will result in, uh, let's say, two and five as output values. Now, if we change the input values, so T, P, and G right now, we'll have that the input layer will do the same job, propagate everything. But then after, the configuration that we'll have will be possibly entirely different, resulting in output values on the right, seven and one. So as you can see, you know, each neuron is, is, has a slightly different input 
and, 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 and the output can change. So as, as the number of hidden layers increase and also the amount of actual neurons per layer increases, the combinations are practically infinite. This is actually one of the reasons why uh, you know, these kind of networks have really taken off in over the past 10 years, over the past decade, because when you have many, many neurons, you need an incredible computational power to manage these networks. All right, so this is what you see on screen right now, the base of all neural networks. Now, what is uh, that makes actually convolutional neural networks special? What is their power? Now, to, 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 uh, to understand that, I would like you to focus one second on this picture. Now, I'm sure that as soon as you looked at the image on the right, you knew immediately which one was the rabbit and which one was the cat. So you didn't have to think about it. Your, your brain already told you the answer as soon as you looked at the image. So if, if, you, if you were to sort of decompose what happened in your brain during uh, that millisecond, it would be something like this. Okay, so I know that one animal has longer ears and one animal has, uh, I don't know, a shorter tail. Um, both animals have uh, two eyes, but one of them has the eyes in the middle, one of them has the eyes on the side. And I know that um, the rabbit, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, the, the the, 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 the front legs are shorter uh, than the rear legs, whereas the legs of the cat are more or less the same length. So your brain did all this image processing and, and you knew it immediately. Now, this is exactly where the power of convolutional neural networks is. Convolutional neural networks are able to out learn how to distinguish a cat from the rabbit without you having to write an algorithm for it. If you try and think how complicated it would be to write an algorithm to teach a computer manually how to distinguish between a, a, a rabbit and a cat, you will agree with me, it would be impossible. It would be really nearly impossible. The power of convolutional neural networks is that they're able to understand on their own the features that make a rabbit and the features that make a cat. Um, if we want to, if we want to give us a, a little deeper look about how this works, just very quickly. Um, let's say you want to train a network to identify rabbits. So what you want to do is you want to take a lot of pictures of rabbits, all colors, all sizes, and feed them to the network in this phase called training the network is going to look at these pictures through a grid, like the grid that you see on the bottom left uh, side of the screen, but then imagine that grid uh, at a pixel level. So a very, very fine grid. Now, training over thousands of rabbit images with this grid, the network is able to identify filters is able to select filters that, if applied to an image, will give as a result, the will detect if the rabbit is present or not. Um, so in our case, training means choosing these filters. And in other words, the, 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 the network learns the rabbitness of this rabbit, what makes it unique. And they are called deep network, actually. The name deep comes be because these filters and the processing of these filters through the neurons is, is, is kind of difficult for us to understand. That's why they're called deep network, because we as humans, it's very difficult to have insights into how a specific ne deep network works. Um, but anyway, this is, of course, just a bit of an overview, but generally this is, this is really the principle 
behind neural networks. And if we're looking at a typical convolutional neural network architecture, if you look at this image, you can, you can see more or less the same layers that we looked at before. Reading it from left to right, there will be an input layer. And then there's a convolutional layer. Um, what, what's, what's the point of a convolutional layer? The convolutional layer is exactly the layer that does the, the story with the filters that we looked at earlier. Um, then there's gonna be a subsampling layer. Sometimes, as you can see, I put two uh, uh, couples of convolutional layer and subsampling layer. The subsampling layer, all that it does is it takes the information coming from the layer before it and sort of half it down. So sort of reduce the bandwidth, reduce the information in half, which is done for computational reasons. It just makes it uh, faster and easier to work with. And so in this case, we have two couples of convolutional layer and subsampling layer afterwards. After these two couples, there's a dense layer. So it's a layer, a hidden layer of, in, for instance, 500 fully connected neurons. It's a very typical number to start with. And, you know, fully connected neurons means, you know, with all these this, this branches going from one neuron to another. And then there will be an output layer tasked with the, um, the, the function of uh, collapsing information into, um, into what we care about. So for instance, in our case, it will be collapsed information into two possible classes, plain or no plain. This is it. If you have a vague grasp on this, um, well, we're ready to start building our own convolutional neural network from scratch. We are going to use actually a, a tool called Deep Learning for J. Uh, it's a library that allows you to build neural networks from scratch. Another very famous one that maybe you uh, have experience with is called TensorFlow. They do very similar things. Um, I experimented a little bit with both. Um, Deep Learning for J is the one I chose because, you know, I am a G JVM guy and this one is built specifically for the JVM. So I felt right at home. Uh, TensorFlow, at least when I tried it, had a bit of a, you know, Python-ish feeling and, and, and sort of the Java API where a bit of a, uh, felt a little bit of a forced API sort of. So nothing against Python, it's just, um, I feel more at home with JVM and, and, uh, and so I ended up using Deep Learning for J. How would we go about our problem? All right, the first thing we need to do is select a data set of images to train our network. Remember earlier I said thousands and thousands of rabbit images. Now we need thousands and thousands of images of a bridge with a plane on it or not. And the first thing we wanna do, see that, that, that image, the, the big image is the output of my Raspberry Pi camera. But really the first thing we wanna do is to uh, crop it first to only look at the bridge because that's what we're interested in. All the rest is noise for our purpose. And also reduce dramatically its resolution. So we resize it to, in this case, 171 times 25 pixels. Uh, this number sounds very random and it actually probably is. I have no idea why I chose it. Maybe it made sense back then, um, but it doesn't have to be that number. The purpose in general of this downsizing is that, well, first it takes up less space, easy. Uh, and it's faster, of course, to read, it's faster to uh, save somewhere. Um, but the, the, the key thing is that if you look at the image on the, on the right, the small one, I mean, you can still see that there's a plane, right? And, and that's enough for a neural network to learn. It doesn't need to be a fully, you know, full resolution picture. Um, that image on the, on the right still has all the major feature, the major shape of a plane that's preserved. And the smaller your image is, the faster is the training. So 
remember earlier on, I mentioned the computational power necessary to do this is very big. Um, and so smaller images reduce this computational power. And if you want to run you know, operations on a Raspberry Pi, you want to squeeze your images as much as you can. All right, so we crop and resize all the images we've taken of these planes. And something that you need to do is classify them actually. So manually, you have to look at all these images and class and label them, classify them and say, okay, here there's a plane, here there's no plane. Because in order to be trained, of course, you need to have first a set that has already the, the, you know, the, the label on it. And so I have to say, sifting through the images every day really was probably one of the hardest parts of this project. So if you start with, with the goal of building your own data set, be aware that it requires discipline and dedication. <laughs> um, but anyway, once you have built this data set, what you want to do is take the entire data set and split it furtherly, further in two sets. The training set that will be given to your neural network to be trained and the test set. The purpose of the test set is after the training, you want to see how the network behaves, how good it is with images that, that it has not previously seen. So you want to keep some of the images for test. So when the training is done, you give the test set to the network and see how well it behaves against the classification that you have already done. Okay, so we have our data set, we adjusted it, and then started from these images, we finally get to write some code. Um, we need to first write some settings, uh, such as you know the input height, 25 pixels, the input width, the depth of this image, which in this case is the number of input channels, RGB. Basically, the number is three because each pixel has information about uh, red, green, and blue colors. And then other settings like the number of possible outcomes. In our case, the number of classes is two, so plain or no plain. And more settings uh, than this, but just to give you an idea. And then this is the core. Now we're ready to build our network in Scala. I built it in Scala. It can be in Java um, or uh, this code that you're gonna see on screen is good for uh, basically any language that runs on the JVM. And, um, and so on the bottom right, you see the simplified layer version of this convolutional neural network. For simplicity, we're gonna use only one convolutional layer and only one subsampling layer. Okay, it's Java, so we start with a builder. New neural network configuration dot builder. And then we start by adding an input type. Set input type, and we specify that it's a convolutional input type, that our images will have such width, such height, and such depth. And this corresponds to the input layer that we saw earlier. Then we add our first layer, Layer number zero is a new convolutional layer. It's a builder of this convolutional layer. And those numbers that you see, five and five, those parameters, what are those? Well, they are the, the size of the grid. Remember before I, show, I showed to you a grid on top of a rabbit? Those numbers are basically describe how how wide the grid will be. This grid, um, that means five pixels by five pixels. So of course the proportions are wrong in the images here on screen, but to give you an idea, we'll have this grid, which is going to move across the image and identify, you know, image after image patterns. If an image is classified as having a plane in it, this grid will identify which features occur in all the pictures that you labeled as a plane versus all the picture that you labeled as no plane. 
if you look at the convolutional layer builder, then you have um, an input and dot and in with the depth that is, you know, the three RGB colors. The stride that you see on the next line is how fast the grid is going to move across the image. So in this case, this five by five pixel grid is going to move on the image by one and one pixel at a time. So sort of diagonally looking at, at, at the entire image. And then finally, the number of outputs of this convolutional layer. This was the core, because then after we have the subsampling layer, there it is, layer one is the new subsampling layer, which you see kernel size and stride two, 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 that basically means that we're halving, halving the information that we received from the previous layer. And then after this, we have a big chunky brick, the dense layer with 500 connected neurons. We add that. And then finally, we have the last layer, which is the output layer, which will output how many classes? Remember, two, plane or no plane, and we add it. And then finally, that sort of final build is the, the, the closing build. And on the left, you see our complete description of all these layers, one after another. So, of course, actually, if you if you were to copy and paste this code from my slides to to a actual program, it wouldn't compile. This code is a little simplified, but later you'll see I have a GitHub repository where you can see the actual repos the actual code, and it's not very different than this. Sure, there's more parameters here and there, but this is the core. It's nothing really really scary. You need to know what these layers are and what they mean and what they do, but code-wise it's not that complicated thanks to libraries like Deep Learning for J. All right, so we have our network model um, laid out. I, you know, this, this talk originally was planned to be live and I had a, like a Raspberry Pi on stage and, and a live training, la la la, but because of this virtual, thanks COVID, situation we uh, we only gonna see a screenshot so and this is a complete screenshot of a run where you basically say okay be your network this is the folder with the images start training and the training if you remember from earlier that means understanding which filters we need to look at an image to detect whether there is a plane or not well in technical terms these filters are the weight on the input of the transfer functions of each neuron. So each neuron, remember, has transfer function, the big circle in the middle that has some inputs. Well, those inputs are weight, and setting those weights is basically the translation of the filter. Maybe this is too much detail, but this is the general idea. What you can see in the screenshot is when you start a training, there's, if you read the, these lines, there are, different, there are different epochs. An epoch basically means iteration. So from start to end, the network is going to look at all the images one by one and train the, the neurons accordingly. So modify, tune the weights on the neurons accordingly until the combination of all the neurons for some reasons that are not deterministically but just sort of going uh, by trial and error the combination of these weights are finally able to identify whether there is a plane or not and so what you can see is that um, if at an epoch uh, there is a higher score a new best performance configuration of the neurons better than the previous iteration then that configuration is taken as the good one and I think in this case I gave a maximum length of training of six minutes by the way I trained this on my MacBook Pro the Raspberry Pi was not able to handle it um, and so after six minutes the best 
score was obtained, I believe, at epoch number five, and the best score is 0 0.96. We'll see later, what, what does it mean, 0 0.96? Um, we'll see it later, but the idea is after you've done this training, the best configuration of neurons is saved into a file that you can move around. And for instance, in my case, transfer to my Raspberry Pi and put it to work. All right, so we've run our training, we've, we've built everything. What are the results of my experiment? Well, it turns out my Raspberry Pi was able to do quite a nice job. I did create a Twitter uh, account called Planes on Bridge that basically once an hour would post a picture of uh, the bridge with a plane on it. And it was actually quite, quite satisfying for me to see. Um, also, those pictures, there are some really beautiful because I, I kept it there for a few months and, and so you see the, the, the seasons change, la la la. Um, it wasn't the most popular uh, Twitter account. There's maybe 11 followers or maybe now there's 15 or something. It's mostly my friends, um, my family, of course, and, uh, <laughs> and some people that attended this talk before. Um, so it kind of worked. But how well, though? There is one last part we need to look at. And how do you evaluate the performance of a deep learning network? So when a deep learning network sees an image and gives a prediction about it, so you give it an image and the outcome is, yes, there is a plane, or yes, there is no plane. Um, this outcome can be classified in four different categories which are this one, and they compose the confusion matrix. The first one in the top left is a true positive. That means in the image, there was a plane and the model saw it. So all good. But just under it, in the bottom left quadrant, there is a false positive. That means that the model saw a plane, but in reality, there wasn't any. Uh, conversely, in the top right quadrant, there is a false negative. That means that there was a plane in the picture, but our network didn't see it, didn't, and so the outcome was that, oh, no, there is no plane. And finally, uh, bottom right quadrant, true negative. That means that there was no plane on the bridge, but also our model didn't see one, luckily, so it's a true negative. And when you map um, this, the, the, you know, if you look, at the images and, at, and you compare them with the network prediction, then you can see how many true positives, how many false negatives there are, and so on. And you can map this to a few important measurements. Uh, without looking too much at the math, in this graph, you see the plot of two, uh, of two of these measures over time. One is the precision, the blue line. The precision tells us how well the model avoids false positives. And that means if, if you look at the blue line, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, often it's one. So these two values, they can vary between zero and one. And the blue line is often one. So yeah, pretty nice. That means that when my model sees a plane, probably there is a plane. It avoids very well false positives. The red line is called recall. And it expresses basically how, how well the model avoids false negatives. And as you can see, that line, the red line, is not that great. It's often in the middle range. Some days it's really bad. It's never really good. That means that my model is not very good at avoiding false negatives, which means that a few times, some, quite a few times, there is a plane on the bridge, but my model doesn't see it. And so, generally speaking, uh, training a network is often a balance. You need to check uh, and choose which, which um, skill you want your network to have. Often, if you have a, metal, a network with a very good precision, it's difficult to have also very good recall. And so, for instance, there are cases where, let's say, um, 
you know, in some use cases, you want to, to favor one rather than the other. Um, in a, uh, for instance, in a deep network that detects the presence of, uh, let's say, a cancer in a patient in a hospital, um, it's probably better to have a lot of false positives. So you are telling someone, yes, you might have cancer, but it doesn't have it. Then false negatives. You want to avoid false negatives at all costs. You don't want to diagnose a patient as healthy when he's not. So each use case has a different choice. And in my case, what I wanted to avoid is I wanted to avoid tweeting pictures with no planes in it. So I really want a good precision, uh, but recall wasn't that important. I, I, I could tweet, uh, uh, if, if there was a, a picture that I didn't tweet because the network thought that there was no plane, uh, but that was okay. I have enough pictures with plane, but I really wanted to avoid uh, false positives, if that makes sense. Well, anyway, we're, we're at the end of the presentation. Um, it's fun to see sometimes my network uh, got it wrong. As you can see, there are some days that it's really bad. The results are really low. And, and, and why that is, if I go look at the images? Well, we're in the Netherlands. So unsurprisingly, a major reason for my network to go wrong is the weather. Um, as you can see, like in the top left image, the, you know, it's very foggy, so you can barely see the plane. Uh, in the top right, it, uh, it, it rains. Uh, so there's a drop of waters, drops of water on the glass and, and the network is very confused because the shape of the, of the plane is changed. Uh, in the bottom left, if you squint your eyes, there is actually a plane, but the sun is just in front of the, of the camera. So the contrast is, is everything so dark and the contrast is, contrast is extreme and, and it's difficult to see the plane. Oh, and also this is pretty funny the bottom right image, you know, for us humans, it's so easy to say, of course there is a plane on the bridge, but the plane, we only see part of it. And, and for Raspberry Pi, you know, for, for my neural network, maybe, you know, the, the, the head of the plane was a crucial part in those filters. And if you remove the head or remove the tail, it's very confusing for the network. And you know, for me, this journey was really also about realizing how powerful the, the neural networks that we have in our brains are. You know, if you look at this plane, again, uh, at this image, of course there's a plane, only, only we don't see the head, we don't see the, the, the pilot cabin, but for a, you know, a, 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 an artificial neural network is a lot more complicated. And then the last thing that I really wanna to touch on, there is another reason why sometimes the network goes really wrong, and that's because of AI bias. I, I totally did not expect this, but even for a small, playful, uh, just learning process like project like mine, AI bias plays a role. You know, I'm based in Amsterdam, and the national company, is, the national air, air, airline is called KLM, and the planes are blue. So that means that my network in the training set of the images, most of the planes are blue. That means that when there is a blue plane on the bridge, my, my, my neural network will, will be like, oh yeah, man, boy, of course there's a plane on the bridge, there it is. But when there's another plane, say a white one or, or a, a whatever red one, a, a yellow one from DHL, well then in that case, the network has a lot more trouble is a lot more uncertain. And so AI bias makes the network miss a lot of planes. And, and I really think that AI bias is a really crucial issue that humanity has to tackle as a whole. Um, it's, you know, creating a balanced training set is really, really difficult, but really, really important. Um, and, and, and it shouldn't be up to us, shouldn't be up to engineers to create a balanced training set. But anyway, that's a whole different story, but 
I think it's really important to mention it. Um, so the project ended because one day there was a leak next to the window and so the water entered the Raspberry Pi and it was basically fried instantly beyond repair. Uh, that's a sad end of my Raspberry Pi. Um, so I, I took it, say, well, okay, what, what do I do with this? I put it into a frame and I put some soil in the Ethernet port. It became an Ethernet pot and, uh, and grew a little plant in it. <laughs> so uh, actually I tweeted this picture and, uh, and this tweet was way more popular than any, any plain picture. What are the next steps for you? Uh, if you found this talk inspiring, uh, you can certainly learn more about deep learning and convolutional neural network. That is the book that I used called A Partitioner Approach. Uh, it uses deep learning for j the same library. The book itself is not very new, but the foundations haven't changed and it's, uh, it's really good. And then I would suggest you to find a fun, fun use case to experiment with. If you want, the link you see on screen is my repository of this project. Uh, so you have already my plain uh, data set and also the code, the actual code. And, and, and then, you know, you can think about a use case in some domain that you know, maybe, maybe something that you know for work or something that you're passionate about. Um, and, and, and then you can go have fun with, with some deep learning experiments. Um, this was it for me. Thank you very much for attending my talk and, and hosting me. Thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you very much. There is a question from John Swan. It says, how did you obtain the layout of your convolutional neural network? How many layers, dimensions, stride? Was this discovered by trial and error? So thank you very much, John, for this question. Really, really nice. Um, I started with, uh, so if you look at this book or, or in general, uh, deep learning resources, uh, this configuration that I had is a configuration that people know it kind of works. So the suggested approach is to, to start with this one and then tune it. Maybe you can add or remove neurons, you can add or remove layers, but they say, you know, this network has given good results in the past, so it's a good starting point for your own. But um, there is absolutely no way at this moment in history to be able to predict, like, for this problem, I need so many neurons. It's no go, not possible, not yet. All right, we hope that answers your question, John. I, I don't want to be, um, uh, you know, I, I know TensorFlow is, is a very popular, library and, um, and and I don't have personally nothing against it. Um, but I, I use deep learning for J because I sort of felt better for me, but I in, in no way I want to, you know, be judgmental against TensorFlow. If, uh, if, if Python, if, you, if your fingers move automatically when you type Python, probably TensorFlow is the best choice at this point. I just <laughs> want to make that clear before I receive some, <laughs> some, <laughs> some claim. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, uh, if no one has uh, any more questions, then uh, I guess we can call it a bit early. Um, well, then I would like really to thank you both, Fabio. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we had really two two great talks. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for being part of Surface Circus. One more time, thank both you. of you, for a second time. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.